Live from the Summa office, this is MuniCast, the municipal podcast that tackles the topics you need to know. And I'm your host, Sean Whiskar. This podcast is brought to you by Sastel's innovation and collaboration team. Sastel can help you sort through the noise to create solutions that add value quickly. Whether it's reducing your environmental footprint, driving investment, community development, or just saving money, contact your Sastel account manager to find out more. On today's episode, guest host Crystal Froese sits down with the first ever woman mayor of Regina, Mayor Sandra Masters. The conversation is around the role of women at the council table and the work that each of these women do to create space for female leaders. There's lots to discuss, so go ahead, Crystal, and jump into it. So nice to see you, Sandra. Although it's not in person, it is. Uh, it's great to to have a conversation with you today. And I just want to say a thanks to the municipalities of Saskatchewan for making this possible for both of us to tackle in a really short amount of time a very important topic, which is the role of women in politics. And as you know, municipal politics are always known as the the ones that are closest to the people, um, which uh, we can both appreciate. But this is really about the role of our voice around the table. And and here in Saskatchewan, one of the things that I have learned as I have been elected official since 2016, is that women in the province are about 50% of the population. We have almost, uh, I think it's something like uh, 23 or $24 billion we contribute to the GDP. And women-led businesses look after almost 200,000 employees in our province. So having a, a, a voice at the table, just based on stats alone, is really important. But from your perspective now, as you are the very first mayor, woman mayor of uh, Regina, what, what does it mean to you to, to, to be a woman in politics in this day and age? I get I asked this question quite a bit. It clearly, I think that happens when you're the, the first of anything. And uh, I always answer that I don't know what it's not like, what it's not to be a woman. And so (laughs) (laughs) I'm not sure, all joking aside, the reality is, is that I don't experience, for example, um, any form of um, people not wanting to talk to me or people uh, trying to talk around me. They deal with me as they deal with me. What I think I probably took for granted, frankly, was how important the representation is to others. And so from an internal perspective, it's sort of business as usual. You've kind of, you ventured into something um, sort of eyes wide open and are participating and learning and doing what any person entering the role would do. At the same time, it's understanding that the representation is significant because as a younger woman or or older, frankly, when you don't see yourself in that role, um, it maybe doesn't enter into the uh, ambition that you might create for yourself going through life. And so I'm really cognizant of the fact that it's important to young women. I have a lot of uh, young women that approach me that think it's the coolest thing. And then I, my suggestion back is, well, my job is not to embarrass my kids, not to embarrass my city. And, and as it turns out, not to embarrass all women. Part of the challenge is, is that we're not homogenous. Like everything that I say, not every woman will agree with. And so it's about finding a little bit of balance in terms of whether that be from a policy perspective or it just even kind of some of my opinions, understanding, and, and, and I always, when I get asked, like, you know, what do you have to say in terms of women supporting women? What you can support and not agree with everything I say, like, that's, that's kind of the, the, the underlying principle of it. But I have a lot of young women who think it's very cool, or mothers who, when they're looking at their daughters now, like, this is something that when you're organizing your life and creating that ambition for yourself, that this would be something that's now completely within your wheelhouse. It's natural now. Uh, and, I, and I think that's probably the significance of it, is that in terms of, of people need to understand that there's, there's no special magic to this, that it's just determination and hard work and spending a lot of time learning the issues and learning um, the responsibilities and, and that you go from there. But I think that's true in, in, in most leadership positions. Yeah, absolutely. And 
um, you know, the formula has been the same for campaigning for years, um, you know, becoming involved in your community, raising awareness for issues. Often, I, you know, one of the common questions we get is, why did you run for any level of government? And I don't believe that's any different for, for men or women. Almost always, it's because we want to see a change and or we think we can do it better than the person who's already in the role. That's often the, the reasons. And I, and I see for myself the impact I have when I'm looking back. When you when you talk about young women, um, I have seven nieces, uh, all of uh, you know relatively <laughs> crazy age. You know they're all looking for jobs or going to university or just finished their schooling. And I see the difference from their generation to where I was when I was their age, and even to the point of the decisions they make in high school. One of my nieces decided she wanted to be on the football team. And not just, you know, in an in administrative role, but actually on the D-line. And she's not much bigger than me. And she went ahead and, and did that. Um, and in my generation of high school, that would not even have been a consideration. But I think it's the attitude um, of, of, that I have helped to change for her that go ahead and give it a try. Like, why not? Um, and breaking those barriers, even on that subtle level, where young women can start to see themselves in roles where there was never opportunities. And I think that's one of the key things. We're, we talk about equality a lot. You know, it's quite, can be quite the buzzword too. We're all equal, but there's not all equal opportunities. And we, I did a, an event um, a couple of years ago called Our Voice, Our Province. And I gathered about 11 women in leadership roles from our province all together in one room. And we talked about what were some of the barriers that they had? And, you know, one of them that came up was about how we treat women in leadership roles today can, is actually a barrier. And it's actually one of the key reasons why younger women don't want to get into politics. So you're over 100 days as mayor. How do you see that in the way that you are in politics now in, in the way that women are treated in, in leadership roles, have you had any, anything that's popped up that kind of make, made you go, boy, we sure got to change that attitude? I don't read social media. And I would just give that advice to everyone in general. Don't. Even in terms of press releases, I, uh, I started out that I was sort of going through and then I'm like, you know what, someone else can go through this. I don't need to. I have this motto or way of being, which is to run in politics, to be elected, you actually have to be able to connect with people. Like in essence, when you think of a vote count, it's a, in some respects, it's a popularity contest, but it's a popularity based upon what you have to say, how you deliver your message and whether or not people feel that you can connect with them. And any good politician from that perspective, probably that's the same formula. You said it a little bit earlier, like it's the same formula. And so I, I think the struggle is, is that you need to accept that you can't please everybody. You also need to accept that being likable is not the same thing as being liked. And I always say that, that I have to be open-minded and listen. And I think those are talents that women bring to the table in, in, in a kind of an exponential way. But that if people don't like me, I actually really don't care. And I'm quite dismissive at this point in my life of, you know, comments that get said like, well, that's what you get when you elect a female mayor they are laughable to me. And, you know, I've got some staff around me that, that get a little outraged. And I just laugh and say, just give it a minute. And what's interesting now is that other women and men have a voice in terms of they stand up where you, you just go through and you work hard and you try to do the best that you can and, and, and do the right thing. And if any of that kind of nonsense is what I call it is, you just let the other folks kind of deal with that in a way. And I would agree with you in terms of like, so my children are all 31 and younger. Um, and their perspective on this is completely different. Like it doesn't occur to them that a woman, that their mom, number one, wouldn't be mayor, um, but that a woman wouldn't be in a leadership role. And I, so I think there's this huge shift and they're also the ones that are where, where they may not come out to vote, which is an issue for politicians. Yes. Uh, that's on us. Um, well, they may not come out to vote. They're incredibly active in political issues and things like equity and diversity and inclusion. And so it's this really interesting balance where you can come for a, a, a female and 
and I'm not naive. Like I understand um, of what can get said, what will get said, but it, it doesn't matter to me as a person. If it's a specific to an issue, I'll pay attention to it. But the rest of it is sort of, which again is kind of how you have to live your life. You sort of ignore it while you're getting to where you want to get to. And then you pay attention to it from an external perspective to make sure that it's just unacceptable. You just sort of shut it down. It was interesting because I was having an International Day of the Women on March 8th. I happened to have a, uh, a meeting with uh, a CEO here, female CEO. And she comes from out West. And she had a comment to make about it is far easier to get at the table in the province of Saskatchewan, the city of Regina even, than it was where she comes from in BC, which was startling to me. And I sort of had this moment where I sat back and I said, well, isn't that interesting? Because that wouldn't be our reputation. I don't think necessarily considering yes. all of the responses from North America I got when I won this election, uh, but <laughs> it's so surprising to people, but really like I came from being a chair of a board of directors uh, on a mm -hmm. municipal corporation, which we had equity on that board. It, it's really interesting to me. They do vilify women and I'm just, I just sit back and l kind of let folks around me who don't want to put up with that stuff not put up with it. And so, yes, I get comments about you should tie your hair back. And I get comments about <laughs> you maybe laugh too much, Sandra. And I don't care, right? Like there's this element to it, which it's so nonsense. And it's a little bit of a, just watch me. Like it, you, you sort of shrug and, and kind of move on. And I think if you don't sort of strengthen your resolve to just code it as nonsense, make sure again, if it doesn't get addressed, that it gets addressed and shut down. But really, it doesn't belong at the desk I sit at. It doesn't belong at the council table. And it doesn't belong out in the city. And so it's, it's, it's really just kind of having that resolve to move forward and say, I'm not going to pay attention to it. I relate to you so much when you say about tying your hair back. Uh, my first few council meetings, the messages I got weren't about the content I was bringing to the table. It was about, you need to sit up straighter. You need to do this. You need to do that. And I'm like, holy smokes. Okay, uh, on to the next topic. I need to be educated about what I'm talking about. And I need to weigh the decision before us. And then I need to make a decision. Actually, that's what I need to do. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, there are moments in my experience where uh, I can't just set that aside. And I'll give you a couple of examples. I've been in some of the committees and, and some of my duties when I was deputy mayor was, you know, to represent our city to go do uh, specific things and being in introductions. And I have had a couple of times actually go uh, shake the person on one side at hand and shake the person on the other side and not me. And same with uh, introductions, you know, introducing everybody and then finding out that I'm actually there to be the keynote, uh, obviously thinking maybe that I'm someone's spouse or uh, administrative uh, support. Um, and I, in those instances, I don't want to make people feel bad, but it is a subtle teachable moment for me to, in the way I react to it. And the one case where I got kind of overlooked for the, the shaking of the hands, I just waited till the person got finished, everybody, and then I offered them mine um, and introduced myself because I didn't want them to feel bad. But, you know, I also know other people in the room knew who I wa was and my role. So, you know, I think there is those kind of subtle teachable moments that we can't let pass by because we know that there are women that are also experiencing those. Yes. And probably throughout my career, if, if I go back into some of the things, and I, and I think that's sort of, you are the culmination of those types of experience where you were, I don't know about you, but sometimes something has in the past passed you by where you let it go because you didn't want to make someone feel bad. Uh, politeness can be a scourge sometimes, um, uh, <laughs> but that, um, and you do that moment where you're like three hours later going, Oh, I should have done this, or I should have done that. And, and where you just, the next time you're sort of prepared for it, where you mentally kind of prepare for it. And I think probably from where I come from and what I come through, um, I've sat at tables before being the expert on an issue and literally would not get spoken to. Like, even if I answered, it would like, it had to be translated to the guy junior to me sitting next to me. Yeah. Has that happened in my life? Absolutely. I have a tendency now just to leave the translator out of the room. And so there is no choice, but kind of to that point where you sort of, you sort of correct it or you, you learn from it and then you modify, you know, I'm going to handle the situation in the future a, a different way. 
yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Th- that's and that's kind of what I mean by the nonsense that I, I don't think you get to be a woman uh, over the age of 30 without having experienced those type of things. And, and, and good for you for being very diplomatic and uh, <laughs> gracious, <laughs> gracious in that correction. Sometimes I may not be so gracious. I'm just really conscious, I think, uh, in terms of the office that I sit in. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's also a, a real privilege in that you, you kind of can't get away from the office. I, I have, I've had the opportunity to sit on other panels and, um, and hearing from other politicians who have been in the game, you know, since the 90s. And some of their stories are, um, you know, similar to what you speak about kind of ex- exponentially, like, you know, with, with, <laughs> with international bodies and international governments and um, where you do get overlooked because it's so unusual to have a woman there. Yeah, the, it's great to include diversity and, uh, and that around the table, but the belonging part is where people are treated um, appropriately as well, where there's sort of presupposed view that the woman in the room is there to take notes, <laughs> not to downplay those roles at all, but um, it is, it is a, a perception that, is, it, that we have to look to overcome. So the, the other thing I just wanted to talk about too is because you know, we have women come from different backgrounds, obviously, and we bring different things to the table. And so for you as, uh, as a mayor in Regina, what are, what are some of the things you think that are fairly specific to your position as a woman that you would bring to the table that would help your community, your city of Regina? I do think that, um, truly not afraid to ask questions. Like, I'll be the first to say it. there's, it's not possible for me to know everything and to recognize that I don't have all of those perspectives and to engage in that conversation, to actually pull out other people's perspectives or other details. Whereas sometimes I think probably even in the past, if you're sitting at a table, you may not ask because it may be deemed that you don't know, or, and, and, and then from a, from a, from a woman's perspective, well, then you're not qualified. I'm over that because because I believe that it's only by asking questions and actually garnering that perspective, because that is inclusivity. To your point, that's inclusivity when you're pulling uh, those stories and perspectives from other people and and, um, other areas that uh, you're just going to arrive at better understanding, which then should garner better decisions. And just that ability to communicate and connect and I'll talk to anybody and try to remain open-minded. I mean, I have some pretty firm opinions about some things, but always remaining open-minded. And I really think there's that combination, actually what it brings to the table is if you're willing to ask that question publicly or at a table with people, everybody gets educated around you where the question might otherwise not have been asked. It's the bravery part of it, you know, uh, I think too, or, or maybe, I don't know if it's the, maybe it's the lack of fear. Uh, Cause I know there's some days you don't feel really brave, but there's points that, you know, have to be, have to be made. And um, sometimes you know, look around the, look around the room and no one's asking this and you're thinking, I can't be the only one here that's thinking this. So I, I might as well throw my hand up and, and see what happens next. Absolutely. So I, I know, you know, you talked about your children and I've talked about my nieces and, and uh, trying to set the, the tone and the way forward for, for younger women to get into politics. And voting is definitely an issue. Um, so what are your thoughts around how to initiate that or how to inspire women now that you are the first woman in Regina to hold the role of mayor? And I know, like you said, for some, it's, it's more important maybe to others than it is to you. But now that you kind of realize that, are, is there things that you're, you're consciously looking to do or reach out into your community to strengthen as a result of that, to try to bring younger women up behind you? I do believe that the weight of it lies upon the politician or the leader in, you know, the women entrepreneurs of Saskatchewan came out yesterday and they're, and they're doing a, a, they've done a charter and a champion. And it's when I was having discussions with Rachel Milkey and Prava uh, of WASC, um, it's like, okay, so I'm political. I, it's not business. It's, it's a bit different. Like, what do you want? And they talk about, okay, but what about celebrating and amplifying that voice? And so that's always really struck me that, and it honestly doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter if it's new Canadians, if it's indigenous, if it's a young entrepreneur, it doesn't matter, but it's in terms of making sure that you're aware that your platform and the fact that you have a microphone in your face all the time you can start to talk about some of the great things or challenges that are going on, but really engaging at that level too. So just 
always being conscious to create some space, but it is the onus upon the elected officials to reach out to youth and to really engage. And I think that's where the sparks come and making space, whether that's a campaign team or community organizations, uh, we have a tendency to cycle through the same folks all the time, mm-hmm. but it's really about, okay, we want someone, reach out to the U of R and find someone in poli sci that wants to participate in this and getting them to the table and having some experiential learning because word of mouth really works, I found. Yeah, absolutely. And I am, I'm always excited when I get invited to speak at graduations. I don't have your typical, um, I don't have your typical speech, I don't think. Um, As I've heard, you know, usually there's a few other levels of government that are invited as well. I always come from the, from the place where I, I, I speak to them as their voters. And I say, you know, now some of you are 17, some of you are 18. You're now considered adults and you're now voters. So um, you are, will now have at the next election, the, you know, the, the choice to choose who you want. You know, it's the, it's the best. I said it's the best experience of hiring anybody you'll ever have. <laughs> I always approach it that way because you're completely right. You have to be very inclusive, but you also have to approach them an equal level. They have some of the very best ideas I know here in the city of Moose Jaw. They have, we have a youth advisory committee, and I am always so excited to read the minutes of that meeting. Um, The mayor, uh, our mayor here, Fraser, told me sits on that committee. Um, I'm always just amazed at what they're coming up with next. They uh, they are, they they just tackle problems. And I love that idea that you have about going into the schools once we can. That is a fantastic idea to engage them on things that uh, are important to them and let them know that they can participate at that level. Because um, honestly, it, it is, a, is a topic, and I don't know if it's always been this way, of trying to get the youth to vote more and participate in, in that process and that. So I think those are definitely practical ways we can, we can tackle that. So I think the last thing I just want to talk maybe just briefly about is um, the role of women in politics. And I came across a quote from Kim Campbell, who was the first female and only prime minister of Canada. And here's her quote. I just want to read this. People ask me, are you proud of the fact that you were Canada's first woman prime minister? I respond, yes, but I'd be prouder still to say I was Canada's 10th woman prime minister. And I think for you and I, and I'm sure many other women are really looking forward to when we don't have to talk about this anymore. I I mean, I'm very passionate about this topic. But I just want your thoughts around that because uh, you're the first, but <laughs> not the last. Yeah, it's uh, because I do get asked a lot because you, like I said, you are the first and it, it's sort of an interesting fact on its own. But it, it's, um, it's almost like I want it out of the way in a, in a way, like you want it, you want it to, to, to not be news anymore. And when you think it's 2021 and this is news, but it's news across Canada. Like it's mayors and I, uh, well, even in terms of councillors, I think um, 28% of councillors, uh, municipal councillors in the country of Canada and cities over the 100,000 people are women. There are eight female mayors in the country of Canada in, in cities over 100,000 population. You roll that around quite a bit. And I would suggest that Women have been making space for themselves sort of on a step-by-step basis. And in all fairness, men have been making space for women at board tables and in leadership positions. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the ones that are uh, of aware of the significant contributions and the balance of voices and how important that is for all of us. We need more women to run in politics. That's the reality because it's a numbers game. You know, if 100 women run so many, you know, 18% are going to elected. If, if 100 men run... 26% of them are going to win. So, you know, you got 10 candidates. If it was five and five, well, now we have an equal chance. And it's about getting to run. But but women have been making their way because, frankly, in lots of ways, we're doers. You, you end up, uh, if you have children, you end up volunteering at school. Mm-hmm. And then you volunteer past that. And then, you know, your kids get older and then you participate. In, and I hear it from incredible women in our city, which is, oh, no, I, I don't want to run for council because I think I could be more effective at this community level. Yeah. And in lots of ways, they're not wrong, but it's about finding the balance where you end up with, um, there are only so many leadership positions, even regardless in, in, a, in a community-based organization. And so as we're bringing these women up into board tables and into, into those positions or into executive leadership, 
that they make space for let's take a run at this. And, and I would suggest that, that your success uh, being a counselor does create that opportunity. I was like, oh, well, okay, well, she did it. And then if I've done it, then maybe next mayoral race, there'll be four female candidates and, and four male candidates. But it's more a matter of it's, it's possible, but it's a numbers game. We need more women to want to run and to understand that participating on the doing level, you do feel more satisfaction because it's immediate and bureaucracy tends to move a little slow. <laughs> but the significance of, of being at the table that are making the decisions that are driving the direction of bureaucracy, that's really where you don't even realize the change you can affect. And it's a long game. But I would suggest that, you know, this has been a long game for women in its entirety. And so it's just about trying to get them to that next stage. I got asked, actually, last Friday, I was having a conversation with a woman who was considering running in politics. And her one question of me after I stopped selling the idea, um, her one question was, what did you give up? And I said, time. That's That's been it. Well, and I said, anonymity. Like, <laughs> yeah. I don't. I don't go for groceries without a high, but that's actually kind of, it's a perk of the job too. Like it's not, you know, it's not a bad thing. Um, but I said, really it's time. And I said, but to be honest, um, I would be filling my time with something anyways. I would have my full-time job and then I would have my board of directors gig and then my other volunteer work. Like you'd be do, I'd be doing it anyways. And so really it's now just focus time on, on one issue that is <laughs> on one job that's kind of all encompassing, but that's been it. Yeah, I, I just think we get the long game probably better than anybody. And it's more about kind of trying to relay that to, to women who are participating at a higher rate than men in a lot of um, municipal uh, organizations and schools and everything that requires a volunteer and hands-on. Women are doing that more than men, frankly, from a statistical perspective. So now it's just about if we could just get... <laughs> 20% of them to go, oh, okay, this is being handled. I'll go up here to make sure the decisions that are driving kind of what's funding or what's directing that, that they figure out to be a voice at that table too. Yeah, absolutely. It's not, um, I know in all things you have to set up your, your, the balance of everything, because as a doer, which most people, most people like us who want to, uh, to serve our community in some capacity or roll up your sleeves, get in there. Uh, if you're not going to do it, I'll do it. Kind of take, take it on so much. So um, my first couple of years as city council, I sat on like eight of the committees and I think there was only 10, like, you know, it was a bit crazy and which isn't a big surprise to my husband. And then of course this next election season, because we're building a brand new school here in Moose Jaw, I was concerned about some of the things that were, and the potential around that. So I also ran for school board. So now I sit on two elected positions. So, um, uh, and you're completely right. It, these things are doable. I think the perception is, is that the job is all consuming, um, but only if you let it be, but, but also, uh, you know, you're right. Those are some things that I find actually enjoyable because I feel anybody who approaches me anytime, which takes a little bit of a gumption to do, whether they're emailing, phoning, or stopping me in the, you know, in front of the milk uh, at the grocery store, um, they have something on their mind and that, and, and this is the time I need to hear it, even if it's not the most perfect time for me. Um, they are obviously, it must be heavy enough on their mind to to want to take up uh, some time in the grocery aisle. So those are important conversations. And they're engaged. They're yes. literally giving you evidence of being an engaged citizen. And yeah wouldn't as an elected official isn't it fantastic to have engaged citizens absolutely absolutely and so as we move forward for both of us i think um the hopes is that we can engage more young women but women in general as you said in their roles that they're already um building up their own experience in their own communities uh doing things um the very grassroots and holding up their the foundation of those and hopefully through our example because i always believe that's the that's the best way to change things is by example they will see in in you uh first as being the very first mayor and other councillors in our province too um that there is room for them at the table and and that we as women welcome them to, uh, to take part in this process. So yeah. thank you, Sandra, for uh, spending some time with me today.
right back at you. And uh, I really appreciated this. It is really, truly nice to meet you. And um, I know our cities um, have a great partnership in some things, and hopefully we can continue to grow some of that um, as we're all, as I like to say, children of this great province. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks again, Sandra. <laughs> Thanks so much and stay safe, please. Yeah, you too. And that brings us to the end of this episode, as well as season one of Municast. We hope you've enjoyed listening to it as much as we've enjoyed bringing you this educational content. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank guest host Crystal Froze, as well as all of the guests we've had on our podcast throughout season one. I'd also like to thank each and every one of you that tuned in for every episode of season one. Once again, I'm your host, Sean Wiskar, and I look forward to seeing you next season. Bye-bye.